46, we're going to walk. So what's happening, Jody? Well, we're going in here to room 146 to um, have a little breakfast with Alexander Coburn and ask him about the uh, current state of um, politics in America. Alexander Coburn is a uh, columnist for the nation and a syndicated columnist nationwide, kind of uh, left-wing gadfly commentator on uh, politics and is, at the moment, particularly uh, working on the debunking of all the myths that were created by Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. So we'll ask him about that and um, about the primaries and the candidates. It's supposed to be in this non-smoking room 146. Is here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just saw the phone. Oh, that's Kit, my wife. Hi, Kit. Hi. Hello. Hi, Kit. I got the media here. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you a shout, probably give you a shout tomorrow or the next day. And then if, if you want to get Todd to call you, you could. Um... Yeah, I, t I gave him three things to do. Yeah, well, I, t I told him the hardware cloth, the, the posts, and the um, moving the firewood. Good. <laughs> uh, all right. Yep. So, how are you doing this morning? Let's see. You in jet lag? What are you, you running this thing? <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. What I'd like to do is get one, uh, a little capsule on how you view the primary process, then two, just go quickly go through the five candidates with a little extra weight on Clinton. Okay. Um, this is just, I forgot to ask this guy. Okay. Go on. Then three um, would be, if we have time, to, to do a kind of summary of the thing you did last night about the the minis and you know the the sort of first of the of the um, alternative video pioneering yeah. journalism group and um, he's been working in Chicago for all this time through their local PBS station with different shows and he finally was able to boost it up into some kind of national credibility and get some funding for it so there's been four series of thirteen shows on various topics, um, all of them, you know, tending toward the alternative, particularly as far as the landscape of television goes. And this last six was, um, you know, we had one on guns and violence, one on malls, one on aging, that sort of thing. And then we're doing three on the political season. And this first one is in April, the one that we're going to try and get uh, your comments on to um, guy who's been, you know, doing this sort of thing for many years. He had the great interview in 1972. Can we just kind of put this down here and kind of hide this wire? And I think I'll just clip this on. This, how do you like this alternative? You like it? Yeah, it's pathetic, Mike. <laughs> That's part of our look. Oh, yeah? Why don't you Don't stick you it on my nose? <laughs> That looks I good. think it looks, you know, kind of yeah, give me alternative this thing. Let's put this design. In my jacket. Got it on. Oh. 
Okay, let's shoot. Good sound. How's the sound, Kit? Hello, 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 and welcome to the show. <laughs> okay. So, Alex, why don't you, you ready to go, Kit? First, why don't you just um, quickly tell us who you are? I'm Alex Coburn. I write for column for The Nation for a uh, number of newspapers like the LA Times, alternative papers like the great Anderson Valley Advertiser in these times. Uh, that's what I do. Good. Okay. And now, um, just to start us off, would you characterize for us what your perception of the American presidential primary process is? What are we doing? What How do I characterize it? the American yeah, primary what is, process? What is all this, all, all this about? The expenditure of gigantic sums of money for the election industry to boost the waning economies of tiny states like New Hampshire and subsequently great states like Illinois. Um, no, it, well, it's uh, basically it's a way of getting you used to the unbelievable, which in this case might be President Clinton or President Songus or hopefully even President Brown, assuming he uh, stays in the race. Uh, you were just up in New Hampshire, I think you said. Yeah, I went to New Hampshire. It was an amusing spectacle. Remember the sight of uh, Patrick Buchanan uh, shouting at a group of hardcore unemployed and that he wouldn't raise their taxes. Um, New Hampshire, uh, it's so bizarre that everything s starts with New Hampshire, which is such an idiosyncratic and ridiculous state. We'd have a whole different series of presidents if we started at the other end of the country. Or if we started in, uh, I don't know where. Mississippi. For Mississippi. Example. Mississippi. But there we are. Um, suddenly the nation had the hideous prospect of having a nominee called Sangus. Um, the thing about Sangus is he's kind of, uh, I think his appeal is cancer. It's because um, he had cancer and everyone can relate to cancer. And then basically what he's, he's, he's merging his ideas with the to what to do with the economy with chemotherapy. Most Americans don't have much interest in political economy beyond a few tiny things like do taxes go up or down and everyone believes they're going to go up. So that copes with that. But they do understand about chemotherapy. Everybody knows probably someone who's had chemotherapy. So when he says I want the economy to experience tremendous pain and I will inflict this pain because he's had cancer everybody basically thinks of it in terms of chemo. So they think, you know, that's, I can understand that. The economy's hair will fall out, it'll throw up a lot. And then maybe it'll make it, maybe it won't. And I think that's why, that's why he has a certain perverse appeal. Also because he himself, you know, defeated cancer. And people think, well, he defeated cancer. He knows that. He's, he's been through this horrible business. And uh, that's how they relate to him. He's the cancer candidate. Or oh, what, three out of all four Americans die of cancer, or two out of four, or whatever it is in these days. So people can relate to it. That's his appeal. Do you think he consciously uses cancer as a, as a um, political issue for himself? Or he yeah, of course he does. Yeah. Of course he does. Uh, so the thing with, with Tsongas is, do people think he's going to make it? Uh, you know, Bush, Bush goes out jogging every day in a desperate uh, attempt to prove to people that you know, he's still capable of motion, although he's 68 years old. And the usual thing has been that you know, these, these poor presidents have to stagger out of bed in the morning and go running. Like Carter, you remember, who fell over. And that one of the single most disastrous images of his presidency was him you know, being carried off the marathon track, whatever the idiot was running along. Oh no, the most disastrous when he was trying to beat the rabbit with a paddle, wasn't it? But um, with Sangus, I think you know, the, uh, the whole affect is totally different. And the, his, the one thing about him is he may be the first president in a while who won't have this ridiculous, um, well, I guess Reagan didn't go jogging, did he? Um, well, with Tsongas, they maybe won't be inflicted with this, oh, he swims though, you see. Now we'll be put up with endless pictures of him swimming uh, up and down. Well, if the president is healthy, the country is healthy, isn't that the message? Well, Reagan kind of disproves that. Well, he was healthy, wasn't he? Yeah, because he was right. trying to demonstrate... Chopped wood. He chopped wood, and also the premise was he would live forever. Which is, wasn't Gladstone really into chopping wood? Um, yeah, he was uh, into uh, saving hookers and Save chopping wood. <laughs> Save a hooker, chop a tree. That, okay. was, that was Gladstone. 
I'm, I'm going to interrupt here for a minute. Are, are you getting a, a, a reflection off of Alex's glasses? Mm -hmm. Doctor, no. Now that's going to change everything, right? No one have, we have to start go through it all over again. No. No. What? We couldn't. We can't. We can't go through it again. No, no. There's no going back in. <laughs> Okay, let's get into Bill Clinton. What's, what's the story with this guy? It's funny that both, that it's all about death. I mean, the people look at Tsongas and wonder if he's going to die, whether he really recovered from um, cancer. And then they look at Clinton and wonder whether he's going he's to basically die in the fall because, you know, this heavy baggage he's carrying. Now, the newspapers, the press, have kind of called it a day. I speak, uh, you know, there was a vantage point of, let's say, March, uh, but uh, they seem to have uh, suspended operations on the sex allegations. But, and indeed, many papers say the unsubstantiated allegations, but they're not unsubstantiated, they're totally substantiated. Must be one of the most substantiated love affairs in the history of the world. I mean, there weren't actually photographs doing it, but I mean, short of that, there's everything. And uh, it's also been substantiated that he tried to, did get her a job on the state payroll. Which is uh, what brought down, if anyone remembers, Wayne Hayes, I think. Wayne Hayes put his girlfriend on the state payroll. I can't remember her name now, but... Um, is Wayne Hayes the one whose, whose girlfriend fell into the tidal pool? No, that was the other one. That was Fanny Fox, wasn't it? Who, yeah. who used to go out with the Wilbur Mills. Wilbur Mills, right. Yeah, the tidal, tidal basin. But no, Wayne Hayes... Um, Elizabeth something or other, I think it was. Anyway, he got her a job on the payroll, and that was what did him in. Because people say, I don't mind what they do, as long as they don't frighten the horses. But when it comes to, comes to the state payroll, that's a no-no. Well, it's very clear that Clinton got um, Jennifer a job on the state payroll. Um, so there's, that's lying around. Um, I don't know. Someone said, someone said Bush got his, one of his girlfriends a job on this, in the overseas service, so maybe it'll be a wash. Uh, the draft, another problem. Well, they've got, of course, in the fall, you've got uh, Quayle. So maybe there'll be a balance off there. The Republicans won't like to bring up Clint, uh, Quayle, uh, Clinton because you've got Quayle. But I'm not so sure that really works out because uh, Clinton used these phrases like, I'm putting, I, I hate the war and I'm only, uh, uh, I'm only, um, going to go forward and try and join the armed services, which he knew he wasn't by that point, actually. By that point, he knew he was safe because he had the high lottery number and all that. But he said to this guy he wrote the letter to, uh, I, because of political reasons, uh, I, I must, I'm going to go in for the draft. Um, now, that allows people who, if he just said, I hate the war, I'm going to be a war resistor and go and, uh, and fight against the imperialist war, they'd all, of course, say that he couldn't possibly be fit to be president and he was a traitor and stabbed America in the back. But this letter of his allows them to say, well, if he'd said he just hated the war, I'd have forgiven him, which, of course, they wouldn't. But now that he's a hypocrite and he's just doing this, he's not his uh, flawed character. But what, do you think it reflects some kind of calculation on his part at the of time? Of course he it does. A scholar that he already had political yeah, ambitions? Yeah, yeah. 23-year-old? You've met a lot of ambitious 23-year-olds. Oh, they think, I mean, he obviously was thinking about his career. I mean, people when they're 23, they can think about their careers. It wasn't so difficult. He thought, I mean, he was only another, what, eight years, and he was governor of the state of Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think that'll be a problem for him. And then he has all this problem with, uh, you know, this MENA airport in Arkansas, which was a center of international drug running, and there were a lot of investigations, and it really looks as though Clinton blocked all these, um, blocked all these uh, investigations. Uh, and indeed, there's some questions about whether money was washed from the drug uh, flights in uh, was washed through the state finance system. There's been some speculation about that. But I don't know if the Republicans would want to get into that because you've got the matter of Bush and the contra drugs. And in fact, many of the people, uh, Oliver North and Rodriguez, were associated with these operations being run out of Arkansas. So uh, I doubt they'd want to get into that. Uh, so I don't know how vulnerable Clinton really is. On, on all these he's various... Almost, yeah, he, he, he's vulnerable in places exactly where he can't be vulnerable because... Of well, he's another... I mean, a lot of the problems that Bush has, questions about drugs, questions... And then he's, there's Clinton's relationship with BCCI. You know, the, the funding, a lot, some of the funding for his campaign came from this guy, Stevens, who was the person who, a financier in uh, Little Rock, 
who invited BCCI into the country. So there's that. But I, this, none of this really is stuff I think that a Republican is necessarily one going to bring up. So how appealing do you think Clinton is? I mean, how do you read him as a, as a handsome... Um, I don't think he's handsome. He looks like a bicycle like, uh, tower that's been blown up. So the southern frat kid with a little shiny skin. What's so handsome about well, him? Well, I'm not... I'm they not keep saying he's handsome. He's a representative of the American electorate, though, Alex. Well, I don't know. Well, Aunt Hillary Clinton, she's not so bad. I, yeah. I kind of like Hillary. Uh, she's, uh, uh, she's pretty competent. Um, Clinton, look, I mean, he's, he's a southern governor. You know, he's anti-labor. His environmental record is terrible. He's, a, he's that kind of southern opportunist, you know? There's a big article know? in the Times today about his, his broad appeal um, to the black electorate, particularly in the South. How do you explain that? I don't know. Ask them. I guess they think he's from the South and... I don't think he's a racist. I mean, yeah, oh, he really isn't a racist, actually. Um, one of theirs, I don't know, they've heard his name, they've seen him on the television, they think he... I don't know, why would I want to vote for Clinton? I wouldn't want to vote for Clinton. Clinton's just another neoliberal, really. You know, he put up by the, put up by the Democratic Leadership Council. Um, he's learned the lingo, the neoliberal lingo, the same as Songus. Songus is even worse, actually. You know, Songus is a nightmare in, in terms of his programs. Um, you know, this uh, capital gains tax, nuclear power, you name it, he's got it. I mean, and a few little social issues. Well, not so little, I suppose, from some people's point of view, such as choice. You know, you have the social issue, neoliberals. And then, um, you know, Alaskan wilderness. And a lot of uh, high-end liberals love that. You know, choice, Alaskan wilderness. And then they don't bother with the stuff that is for nuclear power and, you know, taking all regulation off business so that business in America will go poison a lot of poor people. That's not part of the equation. So it's a, it's a nicely calibrated little, little thing. So when he calls for sacrifice, everyone thinks that's great. Not me. Not me. I won't sacrifice. Someone else will sacrifice. Um, so that's his appeal. Uh, He's a Sierra Club candidate in a way. Yeah, in a way, yes, exactly. That's not a bad way of putting it. You have a bit of wilderness somewhere else where any rich people can go anyway. And then you let the poor stew in their own toxics. Um, and that's the equation. And, you know, he talks about investment. I mean, he keeps saying we've got to have more money to invest. It's not getting the money to invest. It's, it's taking the money which has been badly invested in, you know, bum stocks and speculative schemes and putting it in the right place. In other words, stopping business from investing it where it wants and telling business to invest it where it can be productive. This is complete anathema to Tsongas. The idea that you might tell business anything as opposed to being told by business to do things is, you know, what Songus is after. I mean, there's nothing... Songus is, in a way, another Carter in that sense. I mean, the thing about Jimmy Carter was he doomed himself in 1977. The first thing he did when he got into office, the Democrats in the, on the Hill came and said, renew the wage price controls. You have to renew them. And the silly ass went down and said, I'm against wage price controls. I'm, you know, it's against free enterprise. Um, and I'm giving them up. Well, two years later, of course, you had inf a huge amount of inflation in the economy. And the only way you could have controlled it was to do what the great Nixon did, of course, which was to have wage and price controls, which Nixon brought in. And that would have saved Carter's ass. But of course, he didn't. He didn't have the tool because being a neoliberal, he'd thrown them out, with the result that you had, what, 13, 14, 15 percent inflation. And that's why Ronald Reagan won. Now, Songus is, is exactly out of the same mold. Worse, actually. Clinton. I don't know, Clinton's a sort of weird melange. You can, I don't think, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's one of these policy neoliberals. He's read a thousand books about strategies and programs and training and this and that. He's never given to me the slightest indication that he has any real program for the economy at all. Well, he would bend with the polls like Bush, I suppose. How about saying a couple of words about Bush? Bush? Well, the thing about Bush was always that Bush had not the slightest idea about the economy. He never, I remember way back in, um, when was it? When he was running against Reagan in, uh, God, my mind's going, but uh, yeah, in 80. Um, it was clear that Bush had the slightest idea about the economy, not the slightest interest in the economy. He was a Rockefeller Republican as far as that was concerned. And Rockefeller Republicanism is based on growth. You, the underlying, the underlying, uh, the substratum of all their theories is basically this growth, and what the Republicans did was whine about it and say, you know, the Democrats are spending too much of it, they're taxing too much of it, we've got to give it back to rich people who made it in the first place. But it's all premised on growth. Well, there isn't growth. I mean, the American economy has changed, as we all know. And they have absolutely no strategy of what to do, except to take the bit that's remained and give it to the rich people. 
But that implies quite a considerable amount of discontent on the part of the poor people. And Bush has no strategy to deal with that. So all this tax madness has got him in a complete jam. So, so like Buchanan hasn't, this, Buchanan hasn't the slightest idea. If you put Buchanan in the White House tomorrow, he would not know, I don't know, uh, he has no scheme at all, apart from a few mad slogans about taxes. So the Republicans have no ideas at all. Because Reagan, Reagan, the last Republican idea they had was supply-side economics, which was, again, premised on growth. But there isn't any growth, so then what are you going to do? And if you don't have growth, you've got to have a plan. And you've got to have a plan about how to allocate your resources and the rest of it. Well, none of them. And the word plan, you practically, it's like Jesse Helms. If you put plan in a picture, Jesse Helms would probably prosecute you. That's planning. That's socialism. Now, the only candidate who seemed to have any sense, in my view, of what, you know, even the nature of the crisis is, is Brown. Brown's the only one you want to stand next to in a bus queue. You know, if it was raining and you were standing under the shelter and, you know, Songus came sidling up. You know, you'd bury your nose in your newspaper. It'd be a nightmare. And the same with Clinton. He probably wouldn't let you. He'd be all over you like a dog, you know, get paws <laughs> like that. Um, Brown is actually a human being. You can talk to Brown. Have you Probably. talked to Brown? Yeah. Brown, he likes to talk about things. Yeah. He's actually, you know, Clinton says he's read books. He says he's read a book a day. I don't know how much stuck in his head or what the book was. But uh, with Brown, Brown has actually, you know, had interesting ideas. He was governor who did good things and he did bad things. But... Um, Brown knows, in a way, how to, how to challenge a system of thought. Like on the environment, when he's in California, he talked about the environment a lot. He introduced, you know, the less is more schumacher and Schumacher-style thinking, and uh, there's some bad things about that. But he has a sort of fairly consistent vision of the world. Um, I mean, he's been a political opportunist, so what? You know, that's what politicians do. Brown's been so discredited by the media just from, from the get-go. Um, do you think that's because they're afraid of him, or they just find him um, unworthy of their attention? Well, some, he got into a sort of warp with the media, of course, from being flaky. And he did some flaky things. I mean, it's true. But, I mean, a lot of it was grossly unfair. I mean, just we took Linda Ronstadt to Africa, what's the big deal? Or, or you know, the other things they blamed him for. Uh, he did do some pretty mad things in the late 70s. But uh, I noticed, uh, what was wrong with the Medfly stuff? He, I saw him apologizing for the Medfly stuff. He basically said he didn't want to douse California really, in... Mal Mal he, he Mal 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 kind of indiscriminately, I think, is what the... He tried to, hold off. He tried to hold off on, um, on the Medfly stuff, and then he collapsed under the pressure of the ag industry. Or so, I mean, the ag industry runs California, what's the big news? But... Uh, 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 Brown, so far, has articulated the corruption of the system, and he's spoken to the constituencies or tried to reach the people that Jesse Jackson reached out to in, uh, in 88. And, you know, uh, some signs of success. Now, what's going to happen? Brown, and I think, uh, he has this flat tax proposal. Now, liberals don't like the flat tax proposal because it's regressive. Everyone ends up paying the same taxes, whether you make a billion dollars or whether you make 35,000. Which is what, 10%? Is that what 13% flat tax on, um, and the only exemptions would be uh, home mortgage interest, rent, and charitable contributions. And then business would be taxed 13% uh, on value added. Now, of course, business would hand that right on to the consumer, unless Jerry in reintroduced wage and price controls, which I think would probably be a rather difficult thing to do. Uh, and so, in a sense, well, VAT is always regressive too. So people say, well, that surrenders the idea of progressivity and taxation, and that's a very bad idea. To which Brown, and he should be a bit more crisp about this, can say, look, the present system, as it actually ha works out, is incredibly regressive. Social security taxes, you know, if, you, if your cap on social security is whatever it is, 1,200 or whatever it is, uh, you know, whether you're a billionaire or whether you make 35,000, that's regressive. You'd wipe all that out. I mean, you, you'd, you'd just acknowledge the regressivity in the present system. And maybe if you did that, acknowledge it and really look how the system operates, where billionaires don't pay. You remember, remember the top marginal tax rate under Nixon? You notice the theme in the conversation, the socialism of former President Nixon? Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the top tax rate under Nixon was 75%, top marginal rate. Whereas now, I think the top marginal rate is about well, 32% or whatever. So, um, as things actually work, the system is incredibly regressive. 
So maybe just say 13% flattening would work out as being less regressive. It's revenue neutral. I mean, in the sense that you know that you get the same revenues out of it at the end of the day. So I think he should be at CRISPR about that. And then he has to he has to be obviously flesh out some more programs. But as he says, I did actually run a large state. It's the eighth largest economy in the world, California, for eight years. I mean, here's Clinton, some rinky-dink state, you know, whose only appeal to people is basically come in here, we'll offer you slave labor and, and toxic conditions, and you can go for it. That's Clinton's economic strategy in a nutshell. Do you think he'd translate that into a national policy? Who, Brown? No, Clinton. Clinton? I think he'd go. I mean, there's every sign that he would say, you know, in this crisis for America, we must be competitive, and hey, let's take off those restrictions on toxics. We've got to compete. He was for fast track with Mexico. Fast track with Mexico means that you, uh, you know, you level down. You level down to the lowest common denominator. So, uh, so under that kind of negotiation, a manufacturer in America, in the States, north of the border, says, uh, my competitor in Mexico is cranking out um, whatever the product is without the environmental restrictions that I'm laboring away under. That's unfair competition. And you know, then they say, well, we'll have to level down and, and uh, you know, nullify the state, the local state and federal regulations north of the border. But that's contrary to the principles of the free market. That's the kind of thing Clinton's totally in favor of. And Songus, of course, is totally in favor of it. I mean, in that sense, they're the poison presidents, or would be poison presidents. Brian's are better than that. I want to shift just a minute away from the, these types of specifics into this abstraction about what, what really ends up giving us these presidents, which it's my perception that, the, um, that these types of details really um, fly right over the head of the American electorate for the most part. And their, their vote ends up being a kind of gut vote on image and in a sense almost like a choice of a, of a new television program for four years or something like that. Um, do, you, do you see that kind of um, you know, overall myth-making media cloud that the candidates seem to spread um, in operation in this primary selection process? At the start of this campaign, uh, David Broder, the, the dean, so-called, of American journalism, I mean, sort of super pundit, wrote a series of uh, columns in which he said, this time it should be different. The media should not go for the quick sound bite and the slur, the Willie Horton type stuff. And it should really examine the positions of the candidates. And everyone clapped and said, well, David, that's very good and very thoughtful and we'll mend our ways. And of course, them, including David Broder, went exactly on with soundbite sound um, sound journalism. They all said, for example, Clinton has thoughtful, well-considered programs because they loved Clinton. They uh, loved Clinton. They adored Clinton. He was everything a journalist, a mainstream journalist likes. You know, he's from the South. He's pro-business. They keep saying, a pro-business Democrat, implying that we've been, the nation has been afflicted with anti-business Democrats since the year dot, which of course is insane. But throughout all this, there's never any sign that any of them ever read Clinton's economic program or Songus's economic program. They keep saying Songus has a thoughtful program. And they hold up a little booklet that he keeps dragging around with himself. If you actually read that, there's a big, in there, there's a, one of the big problems with the economy is how do you get down uh, long-term interest rates, which are high, even when the Fed has lowered the short-term interest rate, the high, the, you know, mortgages are still around 8 9%. This is a big problem. And if you're a thoughtful, probing candidate grappling with the major issues of our time, you have to have something to say about long-term interest rates. Actually, uh, Clinton says nothing. And Songus says, we will devote our best efforts to coming to up with a solution to this problem. He actually writes that in his program. I haven't seen comments from David Broder saying the guy has failed on the <laughs> elementary test of economic strategy. So they have gone with the old, you know, a, a little bit of an image here, a little bit of an image there. And so the, what's the basic image I told you? Songus has cancer, or had cancer, and, 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 uh, and Clinton, you know, um, carried on with uh, Jennifer. The two images that people have in their mind. You know, there's a, this frat boy jumping around in bed with, uh, with Jennifer, and, um, and Songus, you know, uh, taking chemo. And Jerry Brown, I don't know what the image is. <laughs> I mean, wearing a turtleneck, or a, I think he's thrown aside the turtleneck now, but, uh, uh, you know, talking about um, man's larger, larger fate, the guru candidate. But um, in all of this, are people just dumb and numb and sit in front of their TVs, or are they making, sort of, trying to make calculations? I think people are not dumb, and they're trying to figure it out. And they, th and they are thinking thoughts like, 
hey, if Clinton makes it, is he going to get done in the fall? Or if, uh, what song does really mean for me? He talks about business, he talks about sacrifice. Well, Brown, has Brown got any real beef behind the stuff about corruption, which they all believe? Or, and of course, he'll reach out to Labour, he'll reach out to these constituencies. What's going to happen? I mean, I think people very often exhibit great smarts in what they're trying to select. But the system is in crisis. Now, what, what's going to happen, let's say, with the race? Supposing they all go through, what's... There was a historical moment in the 88 when Jesse Jackson had amassed an enormous constituency, got to Atlanta, and did a, got his speech and his platform material out of the Democrats, out of um, Dukakis, and was gone. The day after that, the day after, Dukakis traveled to the South and went to the famous you know, went to a ra basically a racist rally in search of the white southern vote. And everything that Jackson had done was cast out. It was as though it had never been. And Jackson, to his everlasting discredit in my view, didn't hang around, didn't try and build a movement. And basically that was it. So all that effort in 88, all those tremendous victories, you know, all that a forging of a new coalition, a rainbow coalition, was all blown away. Is this going to happen again? Is Brown capable of <clears throat> building up these coalitions, taking them to a convention, you know, with a respectable number of delegate votes, and not running up the white flag like Jackson did, you know, of actually trying to build a movement and helping towards the realignment which the, which the country needs. I mean, why is it that the Republicans like Buchanan, they have no problem trying to build up a realignment. They have no problem with disloyalty, rocking the boat, making Bush look ridiculous, causing Bush to lose the election. That doesn't keep them awake at night. They think that's great because they have a tenacity of position. But is the problem really with Brown that he'll in the end, because his roots after all are absolutely machine Democrat, that in a way he'll just you know, knuckle under in the end? I hope not. That's the big question for him. And it's a big question for the campaign, really. Thanks. You know, um, <coughs> could you... Are you willing to give us like another five minutes yeah. or something uh, of uh, the JFK thing? Because I think that's so interesting. And um, what struck me last <laughs> night about it was your point about about the the um, co almost convulsive liberal obsession with this old myth, reworking this old myth, and how Stone has somehow plugged into that and, and turned it into you know this this tremendous cinematic triumph. <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> Go for it. So, um, what is the uh, what? What is your estimation of of Oliver Stone's movie JFK? JFK, and why has it become so popular, particularly on the left? Well, I suppose the movie caters to a myth, and people need myths. Uh, and the myth, of course, is the myth of the of the of the hero. Norman Mailer said the other way recently. It was a, a, a fallen god fallen God, and that the God was about to introduce an era of peace, tranquility in America. He was about, to, this is the proposition of the movie essentially, and the proposition of the Garrison book, that you know, he was about to do a deal, get out of Vietnam, he was about to make peace with Castro, he was about to make peace with uh, Khrushchev, and you could have had, uh, we needn't have had the 60s. Well, like a, we would have won in 1965 or 4. And of course there's not a shred of truth in any of this. Not a shred of truth. Uh, Kennedy was not about to pull out of Vietnam. I mean he would have done what Johnson did. Actually it could have been worse because he had the liberals. Johnson didn't have the liberals to the same extent. So by, you see, by, at the exact moment he was shot, on November, the, well two days before, on November 20, Kennedy's top advisors met in Honolulu and they suddenly, they all realized, because they'd all been lied to so much, they realized the war was going real badly. And the, the, uh, the memoranda that came out of that, which were drafted by Kennedy's advisor, McGeorge Bundy, are the same language as the memoranda, the initial memoranda of the Johnson administration. Same people did them, and the same situation confronted them, that they had to try and turn the situation around real fast. So, Kennedy would have, um, and Kennedy, by the way, could have again been where he would have been a second term president with nothing to lose. He probably would have dropped the bomb on Hanoi. Like he, you know, people, uh, people go on about Kennedy. I mean, he was the one who nearly killed everybody in '62 in the missile crisis. He was the only insane person who dragged the world to the edge of 
nuclear extinction. And again, with Castro, people, was he going to do a deal with Castro? Of course he was trying. Actually, at the very moment he was killed, one of the CIA men was handing, you know, working officially, not a rogue CIA person, was handing a double agent in Paris, a Cuban double agent, a poison pen to kill Castro. And many say that uh, Johnson always thought that, um, you know, Fidel was behind the uh, assassination because they'd been trying to kill Fidel. But to get back to the myth, the myth proposes that there is a good president, Kennedy, and a good people. And there are these evil elites that intervene between the good president and the good people and betray and pervert the course of the nation from its true destiny. It's a very comforting myth, and it abdicates, of course, anyone from the moral responsibility who've been implicated in killing two million Vietnamese and Laotians and Cambodians. You say, I didn't want that. I'm a good person. And all the horrors were done by them. And he, the person we voted for and we love, was not responsible. And it's a fantastic abdication of responsibility of a rather fascistic sort. It's a, it's a, it's a fascist myth, really, because it says we are people, there is a leader taken from us. It's kind of Wagnerian myth, if you want, but a comforting one, as opposed to the truth, which is, you know, I am part, we are part of a system which most of us endorsed, which produced a president who was a representative of the elites, who visited horrible death and destruction on, two million, on, on Southeast Asia, or who tried to murder Fidel Castro, or who inaugurated you know, a decade-long cycle of coups in Central America, Latin America. All of these things Kennedy did. I mean, Kennedy was the person who you know, permitted the coup against Bosch in the Dominican Republic. Kennedy was the person who you know, laid the groundwork for the coup in, military coup in Brazil, which, you know, which started that whole cycle, or helped start it. By 1962, Vernon Walters, General Vernon Walters, had been sent from Rome to Rio de Janeiro. And he said later, he was told that Kennedy wouldn't be averse to a coup because they hated and were terrified of Goulart, who might have been introducing land reform in Brazil. But if you operate with these myths, you abdicate yourself from history, and you abdicate yourself from the real whys and wherefores of history. And in a way, it plays into the machine of the, the process now. You say, there's Clinton. There's a hero. He'll save us. You don't think Clinton is part of a, part of a system. He's got incredible constrictions on him. Even if Clinton had the finest sort of uh, progressive ideas in the manual in his heart of hearts. As Ralph Nader says, when you get elected, you don't diselect the Fortune 500. You don't diselect the Federal Reserve. And so the only way a even a very progressive president, once they got into the White House, could do anything, is if they have a movement, a real movement, persuading Congress to do something, terrifying Congress. I mean, that's the only way we're ever going to get any change. But this myth idea, and of course, it also <coughs> literally tells lots of lies about history. I mean, I heard Oliver Stone, I didn't hear him, but I've seen him quoted as saying, even when I'm wrong, I'm right. Even when you show Every single fact in my movie, from the magic bullet to the arguments about the Joint Chiefs of Staff, even when all that has been exposed as wrong, as lies, I'm still morally true. I'm morally right. It's not a very helpful way of looking at things. It, it again, it, it helps deny people their real history. I mean, I attacked this movie in The Nation magazine. I got tons of letters saying it's a progressive movie. It helps people realize what they are capable of. Well, first of all, it's demented. Are we to really believe the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the higher echelons of the CIA, you know, planned a conspiracy against President Kennedy? Why would they want to kill him, first of all? Secondly, I don't personally believe it. Thirdly, after 30 years, are we to believe that a conspiracy, which if you add up the number of people who must have been involved on the propositions of JFK and of Garrison, it amounts to thousands of people, not one of them? ever left, even in their will, a little stone, saying, hey, I was involved in the assassination. Boy, uh, tell the guy to <laughs> wait. Could you um, come back in about five minutes? Hi, I'm just, we're just doing a little thing here. Yeah, no problem. Good. Easy Great. Oh. OK, just, I guess just the last uh, sum would be, because su that's such a frightening um, proposition that you're making, uh, and it seems so clear and obvious in some ways. How do you think that, that 
yearning to, to recapture that myth, to find that, that God president. If you look at your crystal ball, do you see that as a, as a, as a, as a developing and um, worrisome groundswell of, of you know, fascistic yearning? Which, I mean, I think <coughs> you felt that. There's something about the red, white, and blue. You, you, you get this kind of swastika. <laughs> I don't know. That might, that, it could be overstating that to say that. Look, a lot of histories, a lot of elections are about recovering an imaginary past. I mean, Reagan, the whole meaning of Reagan was let's recover an imaginary past, you know, which was the, which was the rural, small, small town, rural America, which um, old Ronnie grew up in. Uh, of course, it was all utterly, I mean, the reality of it. Gary Wills is very good about that, you know, the reality of Reagan's childhood, you know, with a drunken dad and the living off basically federal programs and, you know, the real truth of um, Southern Illinois or wherever it was in the, in the, uh, in the 20s was so different from the myth. And, well, I guess Kennedy, and the, the appeal of Kennedy when he did it was the future. You, are, you either live in a totally imaginary past or a totally fantastical future. And uh, maybe in this hour of crisis, and it is a crisis, I mean, America is in crisis in the same way all these advanced capitalist countries. I mean, it's funny when you look at it that uh, <coughs> communism really came to crisis <coughs> when you look back at it in the late 60s. That's when, if their politicians and their economists had really had their heads screwed on right, they would have said, unless we adapt, unless we change, in 15 years' time we're going to go down the tubes. Now, actually, when you look, and they did go down the tubes because they didn't adapt and change. Now look at the American economy in terms of delivering for the maximum number of people, which of course wasn't all the people by any manner of means, as a system of sustained growth, cranking out the surplus and the rest of it, really peaked in the late 60s. And now is in, is in serious crisis. You've got crises of profit realization, you've got all these things. It's like, and it's like, and imagine the whole thing as a gigantic balloon, like a huge plastic hippo, and you're trying to blow it up all the time. And each time you try and blow it up, and crank it off the ground, it settles a little bit nearer the ground. So in what was the 80s? The 80s was an attempt by corporations to recover profit by speculative activity. It was the way they could get a better bottom line. And they got the old hippo off the deck again, of course, at a severe cost. And the hippo, you know, the hippo was good for the top two-fifths of the country and rather bad for the bottom three-fifths of the country. But now what? What are they going to do next? And that they, they, haven't, they can't answer that question. And of course, as far as the world is concerned, I mean, what we're looking at is absolute devastation throughout the world. I mean, go back to the myth, Walt Rostow, who was, you know, um, one of Johnson's main advisors, wrote a book in 1960 called Stages of Economic Growth, a non-communist manifesto, in which he said to the third world, follow our little path here. Don't be like the Vietnamese or the Cubans or the, all the other nations who at that time seemed to be taking a different path. Do this, do that, and do the other thing, and you'll end up as a prosperous, um, middle-range industrial nation. Now look, ruin. I mean, outside maybe Southeast Asia. You know, you've got Latin America and Africa. These are scenes of devastation unknown in this century, practically, going on right there. So the whole thing's an awful mess. How many times do you hear even the beginnings of a proper account of that mess uh, in the election campaign? I don't even care, not even from the candidates who, you know, have many things to say in a short period of time, but even from the people around, even, for, even, in, the, even in the sort of uh, whole penumbra of debate, a real sense of what's happening here. Very little, very little indeed. That's the problem with it. Thanks, Alex. Really appreciate this a lot. That's just great stuff. Okay. I'm afraid it's oh, yeah, let's awfully look restrictive, away. isn't it? It's okay. Well, let's see. So that. Where's your Jaguar? <laughs> yeah, right. You don't get to see the kind of car we drive. <laughs> is that? Is this you in the Geo? Those are the three most literate. 
But I'm sure quite friendly. All the, the, the conspiracy busts out oh, of the woodwork. There's a real, no, he says the letters were literally demented. Demented. And it's the stuff that he proved that the CIA did it. And he'd say, he didn't prove anything. Oh, yeah. And God, that, the Kevin Costner thing at the end is just unbelievable. That 20 minutes or whatever, the, the, the summation of the case. Yeah. You know, the, the, the Frank Capra. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> oh, it's this guy. It's exactly, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. You're quite right. Frank Capra. Yeah. It's the same thing. And he's there's good. good. There's a good, the, the, the whole Mr. Smith. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And then it goes on and on and on. And you just going like, oh, my God, how long is this going to go on? Exactly. But, uh. Interesting. Notice this. This, 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 this combines this. almost every deficit of American hotel. Oh, yeah. The I love hotels. Look at this. This must have been the darkest moments of the, what? Of the 60s. The iron pipe um, structural supports, the, 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 the uh, stone facade. The Papa Brown. The Papa Brown. The Papa Brown. No, you see a lot of this and the Florida. mansard is sort of like a French influence over here. Cubans love this stuff. It's, it's French um, frontier, right? With the mansard and the... And the Little uh, mansard, French uh, frontier. Rustic, uh, <laughs> but this is in Florida. New can, whenever Cubans come to Florida, they love this caca brown. Oh, Have you been to Cuba recently? No. That was a good article by Saul Landau, too. We've got a hurry. Kit grew up in Cuba. She was there till uh, 61. Oh, she, when she was 15, she flew out with her scrapbooks. No, I was a child. Yeah, I was, was a child. Part of the colonial <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I owe you any money. I hope I don't. Ready? Yeah, I think we're ready. You know how to get that? Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I do. Portland. And he was asked to sum up what he thought about American. American. Uh, he's asked once to define what was great about America. He said, America is a country where a man once asked himself, how can I drink my beer without getting the the beer can warm, and so he invented a little handle to put around the beer can and uh, made a lot of money. And Ronald Reagan said that summed up the him, the greatness of America. That's right, it goes right back to the earliest moment. Todd Clinton couldn't say that. Clinton would never say anything interesting like that, unfortunately. But don't you think, I mean, people, as the media, you know, these four-year periods go on, it seems to me people are less and less willing to say anything at all. You know, it's so the, the, the liabilities of a slip of the tongue are so great. Here's the media. The media, I remember I went to the second debate in New Hampshire, uh -huh. and there was the Brown and Kerry and uh, Clinton and uh, Harkin. These names have long since disappeared from human memory, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and uh, Songus, uh, someone else whose name I forget. Maybe there wasn't. And Cokie Roberts. Cokie oh, Roberts. from uh, NPR. Cokie Roberts was in the chair, and she said, now we're going to come to cry. So they all straightened up in their chairs. <laughs> and she said, in New York recently, uh, a small boy on his way to school was abducted and sodomized by a paroled child offender who was HIV positive. Now I'm going to ask you, all of you, one by one, would you have paroled this man? How about that? This is allegedly a liberal broadcaster. Oh, my God. Now, that the only candidate... And you were in the audience to see this? Well, we were watching yeah. all the media people. Uh -huh. The only candidate who had... I, and I gave him tremendous credit for this, who rejected the terms of the question. Oh, of course, they all said, no, I would not have paroled this man. Not. No, HIV I'm not in favor of oh, nine-year-old boys Definitely being well not. sodomized by HIV positive people. Brown said, I reject the terms of the question. Yeah. He said... That's I, what's great about Brown, yeah. too, is he, he really has... He has a well, core that he can go back to and... In spite of his machine politics childhood, there's a, an integrity there that, that, res, that resonates, you know, at the right times, it seems to me, even, you know. Well, Brown, it's not a great thing to us that, the, that a candidate like Brown then said, I reject the terms of the question. It's the questions like that that have, uh, uh, you know, contributed to erosion of civil liberties. And I saw, I saw Kirky Roberts in a coffee shop the next day, a Harkin event, and uh, <laughs> I said, you know, don't you think you have a little responsibility to try and frame things a little better? And she said, well, if you think that, then why don't you ask the question? Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so are you going to go to the convention? Uh, oh, yeah, probably, probably. I don't know. Yeah, well, I guess. Maybe we'll catch up with you there. Uh, Houston. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Houston. Houston. Yeah, I think we're going to go. I love Houston. I love it's, you. Be in, it's in the Astrodome.
clothing, some hideous temple of modernity. Look at that horrible. And pop. they had a, it, it was a halftime, you know, of a football game, and they had an unveiling of the world's largest American flag, and it covered the entire football field. You know, it was 100 yards, but what's this? This is don't. I was in a car accident. What's happened to American design? This is. Um, I have. I love 50. I love 50. <laughs> I, I see. I see a bit of a Japanese influence. <laughs> this is something. This is a cry for help. It's a Fiesta. <laughs> No, it's it's a horrible even, looking thing. It's, it's even more of a I, I love car 50s a, cars. I have eight 50s cars, 60s cars. Oh, do you really? Which ones? I have uh, two Imperials, 57, 59, and 62. I have uh, Newport, two Newports, Chrysler Newports. Oh. I'm loyal to Chrysler products. These I are all have, up in Petrolia. I have a, uh, a Plymouth, 57 Plymouth station wagon. I have a, a Valiant, a 1960 Valiant, one Bush of the great button? cars. Is that the push button? With the Slant 6, one of the great engines ever made in America. Those are those cars. This is when America stop. was great. I have, uh, you know, history would have been different if we'd only, if the Corvair had made it. Just at the oh, moment. Such a one. That, that, that was the, the death machine, though, wasn't it? It was not the death machine. That was not the cool for the run by Ralph. <laughs> uh, perfectly good. Well, they had had a little problem once. They, they've soon fixed that. But imagine if America had had the Valiant and the Corvair. We'd have beaten back the, uh, the Volkswagen. Uh, then what else have I got? Uh, then I've got a Chrysler. No Mustang? Yeah, no, horrible. Uh, no, I've got a, uh, a 67 300, and I've got a 63 300.